Thank you very much, uh, Dan, and uh, I'd like to thank Kess for inviting me here today to uh, uh, open this seminar. And Kid uh, Mila Falce, Rove Galer, a fair fight, Ilias. You're all very welcome. And uh, I think uh, th this is a theme which is dear to my own heart place names and their role in cultural tourism. Um, as we know, we have no shortage of uh, place names in Northern Ireland. And by and large, I think we can say that uh, they reflect the, the history of the place. Um, we have uh, Irish place names, obviously, uh, like Anna Clock Mullion uh, or Drum na Hunchen. Um, Michal can explain them in detail, <coughs> detail to you later on. <laughs> and uh, we have Norse place names, Strangford, obviously, is an example, and Carlingford. And we have Scots uh, place names as well. D down in my own part of the country, we have Newton Hamilton. Uh, and that area around Newton Hamilton was once known as the Scotch country. And we also have Hamilton Spawn. Uh, which is in County Armagh as well. And we have lots of English place names like um, Hilltown, County Down, Cookstown, and so on. So uh, the, the place names uh, do reflect uh, various aspects of our history, and they're valuable for that and for many other reasons. Um, I think the, you know, the town land names are very important because uh, they give us, uh, as individuals, our own map of the country. Um, if we can say, you know, uh, refer to, for example, Carrick Bracken, rather than, you know, that we hump over there, I think it's uh, much more meaningful. And uh, I think it, it, it connects us very strongly with the, the landscape. Um, the Committee for Finance and Personnel, the Chair last year, along with the, the Minister for Finance, uh, launched the Northern Ireland Place Names Database, and uh, that has proved a highly popular resource. And, of course, the Place Names Project at Queen's University has done marvellous work and has published several volumes uh, on uh, County Down in particular. And uh, as an Irish speaker, People sometimes ring me up in the office or at home, and they, they ask me, you know, can you tell, you know, we're building a house here and we want to sort of name the house. Can you tell me what our local townland name means? And as Michal will probably attest, uh, it's very it's very dangerous to uh, use basic Irish knowledge to try to explain a place name because. It's uh, an academic process which involves going back over old maps and different forms of the language, so that in many cases the place names that the place name as it appears in the present day has no relationship whatsoever with the original place name. So it's very dangerous to speculate. But uh, I used to be in a position to be able to ring up uh, K Professor K Moore uh, or. Uh, Dr. Pat Mackay in Queens, and they would send me almost uh, instantaneously uh, a, a, a note on the place name, uh, very often going back to pre-Christian times, so that many of my constituents felt that I, I was a, a, an authority on, on place names, whereas in fact I was using the resource of the, the place names project to enlighten, enlighten them. A, uh, so what role can place names play uh, in, in our lives in the present day? Well, I think, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the postal service, um, mm. rather than postcodes, which are a, a little bit abstract, it's much more meaningful to have the townland name included. Uh, quite often it's more meaningful for the postman uh, as well as the recipient of the parcel or, or letter and uh, it enables us to pinpoint the area more precisely, I think. And we've seen uh, last year during the Year of Culture in Derry, London Derry, uh, that culture attracts huge numbers of people. And uh, I think that place names are um, an important part of our culture. And uh, 
The uh, idea of retaining our uh, townland names is one which appeals right across the community here. For example, um, the Fermanagh District Council, uh, I think the support for retaining the townland names there in the postal addresses was unanimous across all political parties. Mm -hmm. And of course, anybody who's been to a 12th of July demonstration will see a wonderful array of uh, place names on the lodge banners. Down beside myself at home, we have Daverna uh, Orange Lodge, and uh, we also have Altnave Lodge, Orange Lodge, and many others. And uh, I think there's a love right across the community for our townland names, our place names, and uh, a desire also to understand them better, because as I said at the beginning, they do uh, illustrate very clearly various periods and various aspects of our history. So I'm delighted today that we have an expert with us, Professor Michal Manning from Queen's University, and he headed up the Place Names Project there. He's also uh, the editor of Anyam, uh, which is the Journal of Ulster Place Names, one of the few, if not the only, journal on this island which deals specifically with the uh, study of place names with their origin and development. So uh, I'm sure that he will be able to build on the few ideas that I have expressed here and certainly give us a detailed um, analysis of uh, our local place names, whatever their origin. So Mila uh, Falce, Riv Vihal, I'm delighted to welcome Michal. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's nice to be back in Stormont. I was here, of course, for the launch of our database back in uh, January 2013, uh, which was a great occasion, uh, and it's nice to be back a second time. So Today, of course, uh, as part of this Knowledge Exchange Seminar series, uh, I chose to focus on the potential of our database for cultural tourism. Uh, the database has potential for lots of purposes. Education would be another one that would come to mind. Uh, but and of course that may interface with, with tourism to some extent, uh, but the focus today is on cultural tourism in particular. Uh, and uh, our project you may well be familiar with, uh, and I don't want to say very much about it except to say of course that we're not exceptional in terms of the whole of uh, the island of Ireland and Britain, in that there are other projects which are concerned with name studies and uh, the importance of names uh, to the various communities. Uh, which inhabit these islands in, D in Dublin and in Glasgow and in Nottingham and in Aberystwyth. Uh, what some of these have uh, in common uh, with us, of course, is the uh, primary purpose of establishing the origin of names. Uh, in our case, there was the additional incentive when we were set up in 87, I think, uh, which was to uh, do something which involved language in this place, which was less divisive rather than more divisive, uh, because our places do contain uh, the footprint, if you like, of all the various communities who settled here through the centuries and of the various languages they brought with them. And that was recognised in 87, and, that, and it was seen that although this project had a very substantial Irish language component, there were also other languages at play here, and the interrelationship between them was going to be important. Uh, and therefore, that's why it, we came into being in 1987. Uh, I've tried to distill some of our, per, our, our uh, if you like, aims and objectives into, into three. One is the enrichment of cultural life, of course, which is obviously bound up with recording and preserving and publishing online our corpus of place names and uh, their historical background. The other, of course, is in so doing, enhancing an understa uh, the understanding of aspects of language and history as preserved in our place names, whether it be Irish or English or Scots or anything else. And therefore, the creation of space in which people can encounter linguistic and cultural diversity uh, through the exploration of connection between people and place, irrespective of whatever linguistic or ethnic origin a given person may belong to or may perceive themselves to belong to. So our corpus of names, our corpus of Northern Ireland place names, extends to about 30,000. Now, I should maybe ex explain that a little bit further. What I would say is that th that's 30,000 place names which appear uh, and are recorded on our Ordnance Survey maps down to the middle of the, of the 19th century. Of course, new names are being coined all the time, not least in the urban environment of Belfast and Derry, Londonderry, 
and, uh, and towns and villages as they grow. Uh, and that is another strand of our work which we should be, I, I would wish to turn our attention to in due course. Uh, but for the core of our database at the moment, it's the historical names up, and to, up until uh, the first ordinance survey of Ireland, when names were first committed to maps in a, in a thorough and comprehensive way. Um, and that was taken as, our, if you like, our, our basis for, uh, for entry into the database. They are of varying linguistic origin, as I say, Irish, English, Scots, and Norse, much less here than across the water. The Norse influence in Scotland and other parts of Britain is stronger than it is in Ireland. In Ireland as a whole, we have about 60 place names of Norse origin, and Dominic mentioned two of them, which are particularly prominent, Strangford and Carlingford. They tend to be on the coast, naturally, because the Norse were seafarers and came here by boat, so they tend to be coastal settlements on the east coast especially. But really, what we're talking about is Irish, English, and Scots, Irish down, uh, down to the 17th century and indeed beyond because the community became bilingual for a time before the switch of language to English primarily, uh, but also Scots very much from the, from the 17th century on. Uh, and it is the interplay between these three which also is interesting to us as people who, are, who, who work on language in Queen's and in other third level institutions. And it is the combination of Irish, English and Scots of course which makes Ulster distinctive in Irish terms if I can put it like that. Uh, in that we don't get the Scots element, obviously, in places like Cork or Waterford. We get it here in Ulster. Uh, and we shouldn't exclude, of course, places like Donegal from that, because when the Scots were doing their um, linguistic survey of the speech of Lowland Scotland in the 60s, they, the, the two places they went to outside of Scotland were in Ulster, not surprisingly, and the two places they went to in Ulster were Antrim and East Donegal, uh, because they were the areas which were perceived to have the strongest Scottish flavour to their speech. Uh, so we shouldn't, I suppose, forget that there is an interface there uh, with the Republic in that respect. So, um, a map, it's one I've just chosen because of it is convenient for me, I have to be honest, for no other reason, but it just shows, if you like, the layers that can exist in a given place. So if we were to look at this particular map of County Down, we have a name like Sainfield, which appears to be English, but which is a translation of an Irish name, Town Nach Neil, and which is preserved as the name of the Presbyterian community, the main Presbyterian church in Sainfield, Town Nach Neil Presbyterian Church. So appearances can be deceptive. So that's someone's, that one's an English translation of an Irish name. Here we've got an English language name, of course, Windmill Hill, which is transparent to us. Uh, here we have an Irish name, which of course appears now in an English language spelling, Drumahoy. Uh, and uh, all of that, and here we have a Scots name, Rallan, which was borrowed, uh, in other words, brought in by Scots. It's the name of a place in Scotland, which, which was brought with them and which they gave to, uh, obviously, a new settlement in, in the new place, which was County Down. So just even a glance at a map of this kind will show you the various layers and the various uh, linkages across languages and involving different peoples. And uh, I, I think it's nice to see that visually. So that's why I just uh, chose to show you a snippet. So names then have layers and hidden depths. Uh, Belfast is a name which in its current form has been adopted into the English language and that's its English spelling and that's how it's best known throughout the world. But of course it's of Irish origin, Belfastje. Uh, the mouth of the sandbank. Uh, Hillsborough is an English language name, of course, which derives its name from the Hill family, who were the Marquises of Downshire, Downshire being the county down, of course. And Stormont is a Scots name, which was brought again from Scotland, uh, given to this, uh, this house, of course, in the uh, uh, 18th century, if I remember correctly, uh, and which itself is very complicated in terms of linguistic origin, because it all comes from Scotland. Scotland's a very complicated place. It's not something people necessarily consider here, I think, always. But this makeup of Scotland is very, very complicated linguistically. You have the Gaelic language, and you have been introduced from Ireland. You have the English language coming from the south. You have Norse, and you have old British Celtic, which survives as Welsh nowadays, but which was once also spoken in Scotland and throughout Britain. So we have a whole mixture of things going on here. And Stormont actually is a very complicated name, which is a Gaelic and British Celtic background, uh, which needn't, one needn't know, or indeed care about, uh, but it is complicated linguistically. But, but from our purposes, it's a name which originates in Scotland and has been transferred to uh, this part of County Down. Uh, and therefore, because names have varying origins, uh, they have hidden depths. So a name which can look Irish, like Ballytrustan in County Down, is indeed derived in terms of its immediate origin from the Irish Ballytrustan, which means Thurston's town. Thurston is a surname. Uh, and Thurston's tomb is the original of the name. In other words, this name looks Irish, and indeed it is Irish to, a, to, a, to an extent, but it's an Irish name of English origin. 
So if I can explain those layers to you, if we work our way back, Thurston's tune was the name first given to the settlement in the 13th century. We get the Thurstons on record in Dublin in around about 1302. We know that they came here as part of the Anglo-Norman settlement in Ireland at the end of the 12th century. We find them in Dublin. We find them expanding. We find them in County Down. The name of the settlement is Thurston's Toon. Thurston's Toon passes into Irish as Ballyhlustan because these people became bilingual. This is, happens everywhere in all contexts where people, people uh, find themselves in contact with another language, especially if that other language is particularly strong. They become bilingual, and perhaps sometimes they may become monolingual with the passage of time. So Thurston's Toon goes into Irish as Ballyhlustan and comes out the other end in the 17th century uh, in the plantation documents as Ballytrustan, which uh, is, is the form in which it was transcribed first in rentals and, and documents relating to the plantation. Uh, and now that is its English spelling. So it's an Irish name in English spelling, as we now have it, derived from an Irish form, which in turn is derived from an English name, which is originally coined in the 13th century. So we have the interplay between English and Irish and back into English again, which I think illustrates just how complicated things are. And it's really a reflection of how complicated we are as people, because we're not, mon we're not monolithic and we're not straightforward. We're, we're actually very complicated in terms of our, our origins. And in the same way as names can make their way to this place, or people can make their, name, make their way to this place and bring their languages with them and therefore give new names to places, so too names from this place can be brought by the people who lived here for a time uh, to new uh, horizons and new places. And this happened, of course, and I think it would be a great subject of study. Nobody has done it yet. But this has happened extensively in, as you can imagine, in the New World, Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, both the US and Canada and other places. And so we find places called Belfast spread throughout the world. We have an example here from USA and from Canada and New Zealand. We also have uh, the Derry, London Derry examples. We've got some example in USA and in Canada and in Australia. We have an intriguing one off Chile. I'm not quite sure how that happened. Londonderry Island off Tierra del Fuego. I'm really not quite sure who was on tour at that point, but they brought their name with them. And we have, of course, the very interesting examples of Derry and Londonderry side by side. And here we have them in New Hampshire in the United States. And look, here's Derry and Londonderry. And I'm really not sure that that's a testimony to division. I'm really not sure that people are bringing divisions with them from home. Perhaps they are. It's, a, it's obviously a subject worthy of study. But I also do wonder, is there a sense of humor here? And, is it, and are people exploiting the capacity to use more than one form of a name? to distinguish two places here side by side in the new world. Uh, so there clearly is a story to be told there, the story of which I do not know, but which is something I would like to find out. Now, this brings me to cultural tourism, because we do in the Northern Ireland Placements Project find ourselves being contacted by people worldwide for information, people who have their roots in this place. Uh, and the most recent example, and this is, the, this is why it's the person I'm mentioning now, the most recent example was somebody who got in touch with me from Canada, which initiated a whole dialogue online, of course, which has gone on for a number of weeks now, to and flowing between the two, the two of us. Uh, and this particular woman uh, is from Ontario, uh, from a place called Arne Pryor, west of Ottawa. I didn't mention her name here, uh, but I don't think it would matter, uh, because uh, there's nothing, I think, particularly personal about the information. But her family origins in this place were Reed on the one side and Stuart on the other side. So she had an ancestor who came from County Down on uh, on the paternal side, the other an ancestor came from Antrim on the maternal side, and this couple, aged 50 and 42, emigrated to, uh, to the New World in 1822 when they ended up in a place called Peterborough, northeast of Toronto. Uh, and she was able to trace all of that on the American side to the present day, and she knew exactly who she was. I mean, Canadians, we have relatives in Canada, my wife said about first one, the Canadian link is so strong here, Toronto especially, and they talk about what they say is their Irish heritage or their Russian heritage or whatever, whatever way they choose to describe it. Uh, and she was very aware of her local heritage here, was County Down, but she wanted to go back further, and she wanted to find out more. So she came to us and she wanted to know exactly about uh, what the place meant, where her ancestor came from on the Reed side, which was Ballygullum in County Down. We were able to provide that for her, and that, extent, that then increased her interest, and she wanted to know what the place looked like, and she got in touch with people in the locality, uh, and the whole thing mushroomed and grew, and she wanted to know more and more about the sources which were used for our place name evidence and what they might be able to tell her, in turn, about her family. Were the reeds traceable in some of the documents that we used back to the 17th century when they are likely to have arrived here in the first instance? Uh, and the whole thing grew. Uh, and my point here is that you know, this whetted this person's appetite and her family's appetite, and I mean, this will undoubtedly end up in a visit to County Down by this woman or by other members of her family. And I think that's a way in which the Northern Ireland Placement Project can 
I suppose, assist in whetting that appetite uh, in, if you like, having a dialogue with people and providing access for people to sources of information about, about, about what they consider to be their genetic roots. So our resource, then, is, I think, a useful one, uh, and it can provide varieties of coverage uh, and information about names. I mean, there's something on every one of the 30,000 names I mentioned available now. The amount of information is uneven. I would admit to that freely. As we move through the counties more, if you like, methodically, County Down is better covered than County Fermanagh, let's say, uh, because we obviously need to, to do more in that part uh, once more funding comes online. But uh, there are facilities of various kinds, which I thought I might get a chance to just briefly show you. Uh, and Dan has very kindly placed a link here for me, which should make my life a lot easier. Uh, and we'll go in and we'll have a wee look uh, at one here. And let's, let's have a look then at Bally Trust and seeing that we mentioned that one in particular. Uh, and we can see that there's more, one, more than one Bally Trust in our database. There's, there's a Bally Trust in elsewhere in County Down in the Kale, which means it's in the Bound Down Patrick region. The interesting question is, is this the same family? I suspect it is, but, but that needs to be established with certainty. We may never know for sure. But there are more than four references. And I'm going to look at this one here, Bally Trust in the Yards. Uh, if I can manage to get that far. Uh, and you will see what it is we provide here. We provide uh, all of the information. So Bally Trusting, for example, we give, well, what's the immediate origin of the current form? So that's the Irish form. That's the translation. But most importantly, we try to convey to people, look, this is indeed Irish as it now survives, but it's an English, name of English origin, and you need to know that, you know, because that's part of our cultural, cultural richness here. That's part of our story, that things are not always as they seem. Uh, and then underneath, we give, uh, we give an account of the name and we talk about the first instance of the surname Thurston in Ireland that we can establish in 1302, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think it's mentioned there. Uh, I, yes, goodness, I thought I'd lost my marbles for a second. So there it is, 1302. <laughs> but we find it back uh, as early as 1066 in England. Uh, and there's evidence there on the English side. And indeed, the name and origin is thought to be Norse. Uh, in terms of its linguistic, remote, remote, more remote linguistic origins. So there's a whole story to tell there. Uh, and then, of course, here is our geographical information up here to the side. To the side. What sort of place is it? It's a town land, for example. And then we get down to the resource that people might find useful. So here we have references going back to the 17th century. Uh, although this is out of sequence. I was thinking it was out of sequence because I know for a fact we have older references. So here we have one from 1343. There's one from the ecclesi ecclesiastical taxation of around about 1306, Ecclesia de Thurston's Tune, the Church of Thurston's Tune, where it appears in its English form, which seems to me to suggest that the people who lived in this place were at the least, at the very least, bilingual still at this stage, English and Irish speakers, but certainly English was still there and still spoken, and that's very important. But by the time we get to 1605, just before the plant, on the eve of the plantation here, we see uh, English and Irish side by side, uh, and that helps us to plot some interesting things there in terms of uh, its linguistic development. But what might be interesting to the people I'm talking about in Canada or any other place is that here we have the sources. And if we click on one of these sources, which I think I should do, uh, if we click on one of these sources, it will tell us more about the source. Uh, it will give us the reference to that source. Uh, and the person, I mean, it's in Latin, that one, so it's not, uh, it's, it's obviously a very old source, edited some time ago. But, uh, it will give us evidence, it will give us some detail on the source and the person can establish where the source is in due course and they can go and check out that document for more information, uh, which is obviously something we'd wish and encourage them to do. So people then, there is a link then between what we do and potentially genealogy, people trying to trace their footprint back in, in time and in space. So um, searching for roots then, as I say, is important. And that was precisely the sort of engagement I had with my, with my friend in Canada. People want to know where they come from, they want to know how they got where they now are, and they want to know a little bit about where they came from. And we shouldn't forget that on the American side, or on the Australian or the New Zealand side, they too will have family documents of their own. And this, this person did have family documents of her own. Wills and deeds, there may be references on a Bible that they brought with them. Sometimes we find that, they talk about a Bible with the name of a place and say, this was my great grandfather's and he brought it with him from Ulster or from Ireland or whatever way he decided to describe it. And this is the place, but I know nothing about this place. Can you tell me? And you say, well, yes, let's see. 
And the, interesting, the thing about one of the virtues of our database is that if a name is no, is no longer spelt the same way, we have an historical search. So we can put in the name and say, well, look, it doesn't survive in that form, but let's have a look at our historical database. And we put in your name as you have it on your Bible or, or, or as you have it in your will, and then we're able to do a matchup. If it's there, we're able to say, ah, that is now such and such, or that is now spelt differently. And the people are delighted at the other end. They think, ah, so now we know where the place is. So it is a real place. Yes, it is a real place. Where is it? And here it is, and here's your map and all. Uh, and they can pursue that, and they clearly enjoy it. Now, you may not think that this is much in it in terms of business and commerce <laughs> and cultural tourism, although I think people who know a bit about cultural tourism might perhaps contest that. And I just wondered about an example which I might share with you uh, as somebody who t does take an odd tipple of whiskey. Uh, uh, an odd tipple. Uh, I don't want you to be too concerned about it. But as somebody who takes an odd tipple of whiskey and who likes a Bushmills, Bushmills entered my mind. And we all know where Bushmills is, and we know a little bit about it. The distillery was set up by, in the reign of King James I, in 1608, and, and the town is most famous, I suppose, for, for producing whiskey. Uh, and um, we have our reference, of course, in the database to it. Perhaps we should have a wee look. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find that now for you. Sorry for being buttered fingered, but I'm not the most grateful, uh, graceful on the computer. I'll do my best. So here we have Bush Mills, and again, we have to choose. Well, you will have to look about to see which one is likely to be your reference. I think, it's, uh, I think it's this one here. Uh, I'm going to take it. I'm going to, uh, yes, it is. You see, a place can survive as a town. It can survive as a village. It can survive as a town and name. It can survive as the name of a lake. It's the name of a school. So there may be more than one reference to it in the database, which explains why there may be more than one, uh, one view of it there. But here we have Bushmills in County Antrim, and here we have, indeed, what we expect, the name. We know it's 17th century corn mill. Uh, we know in the 19th century it became particularly prominent because it generated power for the tram between Port Rush and Giant's Causeway. And we know we, here we see the reference to the foundation of the distillery in 1608. Um, but I do wonder, I do wonder, might those who are distilling uh, the, uh, the very famous whiskey called Bush Mills, might they indeed be interested to know that the name of the river Bush has a particular meaning in Irish and it actually means, uh, it actually connected with the word for cow, would you believe? Uh, and cows in early pre-Christian Ireland were sacred. Maybe there's a link here between Ireland and India, but cows were sacred. And some of our, our most famous rivers uh, are linked with divinities who, who derived their names from cows. Those cattle were clearly sacred. The Boyne is one, and the Lagan in its old form, not Lagan as a modern name, but in the, its old form it was Lee. It's the Irish word for a calf. And the Bush is another. So it is interesting and I do wonder what somebody who in the distillery might make of the fact that their water might be conceived as sacred. It might be another selling point for them. I don't know. Perhaps I'm pushing my luck. But anyway, I thought it was worth, it was worth throwing that in. So uh, we have, what we have to offer then in terms of cultural tourism is an integrated resource, I think. An integrated resource in which geographical, historical and linguistic data is brought together in one website. I don't know of any other. Uh, and together with that geographical, historical, and linguistic data, we have the mapping, which is provided by land and property services in our Department of Finance and Personnel, and they continue to maintain the site for us, and that's a very important link for us with government. Uh, and it's, a, and it's, a, link, it's, a, it's um, a resource which can be exploited by individuals, but also by community groups. And I'll show you a book at the end if anybody's interested. We had one very, this is just one of many partnerships we've had in the past, but one very successful one we had, in my view, was the one we had with the Loch Nair Partnership. Uh, and the Sustrans Cycle Trail, which they were designing and, uh, uh, for, you know, to facilitate cyclists and indeed walkers, right around Loch Ness, which of course is the biggest uh, lake in the, in, the, in the British Isles, as we all know, uh, and obviously a massive amenity in, in tourism terms, potentially. Uh, and they supported us because they wanted, as part of the story, if you like, of Loch Ness in this region, they wanted also to know the story of the names, irrespective of their linguistic origin, Irish, English, or Scots, or anything else. And we said we we're extremely happy to do that, uh, and that they, we would provide that information for them so that people could engage not just with the physical lo location, but also with the cultural diversity in its many forms of the Loch Ness region. Uh, and that was an extremely successful collaboration. So there is the potential then for exploiting our resource, in, 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 uh, and I'll show you the book at the end, anybody wishes to see it. Uh, there is a potential for exploiting there for our resource. It is a portal, in my view. It seems to me to be a portal or gateway to Northern Ireland, uh, one which is accessible worldwide very easily. Uh, it also has the potential for, if you like, north-south cooperation uh, in the context of tourism Ireland, 
And I mean, we do have to acknowledge, but we encounter it all the time, people from the new world, if you like, let me put it like that, are not always clear where boundaries are. They, don't, and they certainly don't know county boundaries. Uh, and our disadvantage is, if I can put it like that, uh, it's not meant to sound negative, but it is undoubtedly the fact that somebody in America probably first thinks of, of going to Dublin uh, in terms of resources, uh, particularly if they're not very familiar with the political geography uh, as it currently exists in the island. Uh, and there is uh, a Dublin place named database, which they go to first, and it provides some uh, All-Ireland coverage uh, because they're in existence longer than us, and they go back, they trace their origins back to the first Ordnance Survey, indeed. They have a link going back that far. They go there, and then they find that the place name is now in what is now Northern Ireland, and they find that the Dublin database doesn't have that much, uh, and the trail may run cold. It will have a certain amount. And we think that's a terrible shame, and one of, my things, one of the things I want to do at the moment is to try and and we're actually doing this, is to establish a two-way mutual link, a link to our mutual benefits, whereby if somebody comes to Dublin first and says, well, let's have a look at Ireland and let's, let's see what they have, and they Google place names Ireland, and that will take them naturally to Dublin in the first instance. Once they get into the database in Dublin and they come to a county down name, our colleagues in Dublin have agreed that there'll be a hyperlink, which will then take them through to our database, uh, and therefore they will be brought the full length of the journey, if you like, to, to our, our, our corpus. Uh, and that is something which we can collaborate on. Another thing which we're hoping to do, of, uh, and will do, I think, is provide a photo photographic gallery. I mean, the one thing we don't have here at the present time is we have our data, we have uh, our linguistic commentary, we have our cultural and historical commentary, and we have our map, but we don't have a picture or photograph. And I do think that that would be an excellent resource, uh, particularly when you have places like this to show off. This is Strangford. I did this for, for Dan. I didn't know Dan was living in Strangford, but somehow innately I did the right thing on this occasion. And I, I uh, took one of Strangford with me. I mean, if you look at that, that's Skettrick Island. I mean, who would not wish, in all honesty, to go there? I mean, I'd like to go there right now, but I can't directly after the seminar because other things call me <laughs> back to Queen's. But uh, if we had that resource additionally in our database, I think that would be something uh, I think we could all appreciate. And finally, the one thing I, I was going to say was it would be nice to have access to our data by virtue of touchscreen technology, perhaps, in places like the Ulster Museum or the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, so that a visitor, if a visitor came to these places and wanted to know more about a particular place, for whatever reason, that they could actually access this very easily and say, well, where is this place? Oh, you have this, I can access this here. Thank you very much. Let's have a look. And then they may wish to go. They may decide, yes, let's get our bus. Let's get our train to Ballymena. Uh, let's go and look uh, and spend a bit more time here rather than perhaps getting the train back to Dublin, which, of course, I have nothing against, personally. But I think you understand what it is I'm getting at. So I do think there's potential there also. So thank you very much indeed for your time, uh, and I uh, appreciate it very much, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you.